Hello everyone, welcome to your lecture on Renaissance philosophy and the Renaissance philosophy of religion. Put on a little finery to mark the occasion, although still wish I could have raided the costume closets of the defunct show The Borgias. We'll be focusing this week on Pico's Oration on the Dignity of Man, also known as, from his letters, the Oration in Praise of Philosophy. This short document, in conjunction with Pico's 900 Theses, is usually considered to be the manifesto of the Renaissance. Although Pico's oration is often taken to be the core document of Florentine humanism, we'll find that a close reading of the text suggests a more magical, if not transhuman, role for the human being in the great chain of being. To get in the mood this week, I suggest playing some nice Renaissance music, reading a few poems by Lorenzo de' Medici. This is his complete literary works, and also the poetry of Petrarch. Doing so may ease your transition into Pico's grandiloquence. Thou shalt have the power to degenerate into the lower forms of life, which are brutish. Thou shalt have the power, out of thy soul's judgment, to be reborn into the higher forms, which are divine. The hermetic philosopher departs from the conception that there was, in former ages, a unity between God and man. And this unity is lost. And what the philosophy aims at is to recover this unity. Well, that was intense. The question is, can we understand it as a fundamental contribution to philosophy? And not merely as an erudite, impassioned performance of pagan heresies. Is there a perennial philosophy in which the history of Christian theology and the core dogmas of the church can be thought to speak with one universal voice? in accordance with Greek reason and Hebraic faith, as well as with Islam, Western Hermeticism and Esotericism, and the Jewish Kabbalah. This is the enormous project that Pico initiates. Pico's synthesis or syncretism of all world's religions and philosophies into one perennial wisdom, becoming the West's first comprehensive, comparative philosophy of religion. So who was Pico and what qualifies him for this inordinately ambitious project? He was a child prodigy, extremely well-educated, a polymath, and very eclectic. Taken in by the Medici family, who also sponsored Marsilio Ficino, one of Pico's mentors, he read and wrote mostly in Latin, but was also interested in Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. Having the privilege of access to the Medici trove of manuscripts, as well as to the teaching of Spanish-Jewish Kabbalists exiled in Italy, as well as to the translations and commentaries on Plato by Ficino, and parts of the Hermetica, or writings of Hermes Trismegistus, Co is said to have assimilated every document in the Florentine Academy. By the age of 25, he had written the 900 Theses, followed by the oration designed to defend them against the learned society of theologians and church fathers in a public debate. Pope Innocent censors condemned 13 of the 900 points as potential heresies, and Pico's defense never took place. Although going on to write other philosophical works such as On Being and the One and the Heptaplus, Pico's vision of concord among the religions did not succeed. Pico died only six years later at the age of 31 under mysterious circumstances, perhaps poisoning, due to Pico's close association by that time with the renegade, almost proto-Protestant priest, Savonarola. What were the core tenets of Pico's new philosophy? It was basically a reinvention of Neoplatonism and the Neoplatonic theurgies of Iamblichus, Porphyry, and Proclus, with an additional emphasis on a more mystical interpretation of classical Greek humanism. How to reconcile theology and humanity's fixed place in the great chain of being with the will to spiritual perfectibility and the humanist injunctions to know thyself and become who you are. Protagoras, the Greek sophist, had said that man is the measure of things. And Pico will understand this not relativistically or subjectively, but as an injunction to realize our godlike natures. In addition to Ficino's new translations of Plato and commentaries coming into circulation at this time was as well the Hermetica, or writings of Hermes Trimagistus, proven by linguists and philologists that have been written in the 2nd century CE in a Hellenistic Egyptian context. Italian Renaissance intellectuals were struck by the Platonic, Judaic, Christian, and Egyptian influences which all seem to be rolled into this one text. 
They therefore imagined that the Corpus Hermeticum was even older than the Old Testament, that it could be considered the common source or root from which later scriptures and wisdom traditions, including Plato, ultimately derived. Pico, like other radical intellectuals of his day, believed that he could use the Hermetica, new readings of Plato, the Greek Orphic tradition, the history of Christian theology, especially St. Thomas and Duns Scotus, as well as Kabbalistic and Arabic wisdom traditions, to argue for a new philosophy that finally and definitively reconciled Greek reason and Christian revelation in perennial thought. Recall how in the medieval notion of the great chain of being, the created world can be divided into three principal zones, intelligences and angels, the heavenly bodies, and corruptible earthly bodies. Above this system is God and within the corruptible earthly bodies, the physical universe. Everything has its proper place in this system and human beings can be born into higher or lower ranks in the order of the chain. A pope or king being ordained by God for a higher purpose, followed by nobility and then the common man. Because all human beings have immortal souls, they are still separated within and above in the chain from the animal world as well as from the plants and the minerals. Within this theological perspective on the physical world, and according to Aquinas' doctrine of analogy, all things scintillate within and express divine signs. Speaking in different or equivocal languages, the one universal plan of God, in principle everything ought to perform its proper function within the chain according to natural law. But how does human free will fit within this model? And what are the angels really? And what is their role? These are just some of the questions that seemed fairly unresolved in the history of medieval theology, which Pico attempts to take up anew. In Pico's understanding, the human being is still somewhere in the middle of the chain. But instead of having a fixed place, the essence of what it means to be human is to have no fixed essence, but rather through free will to be able to transform oneself and one's essence and thus move up and down within the chain. In Pico's more expansive 900 Theses, he in fact adopts a transmigration of souls theory. He also modifies Plotinian Neoplatonism in order to obtain an analogical symmetry between above and below. This was also a key principle in the Emerald Tablet of Hermeticism and in Heraclitus. Pico does not consider such moves heretical insofar as the material world is different in nature to God, but still in God's image. All of this is to introduce the beginning of the oration and Pico's first great inspiring idea. Most venerable fathers, I have read in the records of the Arabians that Abdul the Saracen. Note how Pico's first citation is from an Islamic philosopher. On being asked what thing on, so to speak, the world's stage he viewed as most greatly worthy of wonder, answered that he viewed nothing more wonderful than man. The quote, Many are the world's wonders, but nothing more wondrous than the human being, in fact goes back to the second choral ode in Sophocles' play The Antigone, a source uncited in Pico's introductory paragraph. Aristotle had also said in his Metaphysics that wonder is the origin of philosophy. In Aristotle, this was a wonder at the beings of the world, that they are thusly, through wonder we learn to think philosophically. The notion that human beings are the most wondrous in God's creation is not, however, found in a literal interpretation of Sophocles' Greek. The term used there is denos, and human beings are the denoteron. Denos can also mean fearful, terrible, or frightful, even monstrous, or uncanny. So which is it? Are human beings the most wondrous beings in the world, or the most uncanny, liminal, and strange, awesome and awe-inspiring, and yet at the same time fearful and overreaching? Many uncanny things exist in this world, but none is uncannier than the human being, would be another way of translating Sophocles' wisdom in the Second Choral Ode. This context does not occur to Pico at the outset of his oration, and he moves from quoting Abdul the Saracen on the wonder of man to quoting Mercury, that is, Hermes Trimagistus. A great wonder, Asclepius, is man. Thinking over the reasons given for these opinions in the history of philosophy, and theology, Pico notes that he is not satisfied that the saying has yet been properly understood. Man is a messenger, familiar with great and with terrible things, sharp-sighted in his senses and imbued with the hunting power of reason. 
That specific formulation, the hunting power of reason, reveals that Pico did indeed read Sophocles' second choral ode. By the light of our intelligence granted by the divine, we are the interpreters of nature. This accords both with Neoplatonism and with the Renaissance theory of signs. Additionally, we are between the standstill of eternity and the flow of time. In Augustine, this had meant that time is something to be overcome. But time in the bridal chamber mysteries of God is also something to be celebrated and affirmed. The human soul position between eternity and time and the fact that we are beings of temporality, nature, and history means in the final traditional interpretation that Pico reviews, we are the nuptial bond, according to the psalmist and King David, a little lower than the angels. The most profound reason for believing that human beings are the most wondrous, according to tradition, is that we are the bond tying the eternal and the temporal together. Our lives at their best constitute a marriage festival of eternity and time above and below God and the world. And this is, according to Pico, how David could celebrate human life as just a little lower than that of the angels. These reasons are great, says Pico, but not the chief ones. That is, they are not reasons for a lawful claim to the highest wonder as to a prerogative. Why should we not wonder more at the angels themselves and at the very blessed heavenly choirs? I have wondered in reading Pico if the third reason for human beings' status as the most wondrous, that they are the nuptial bond or marriage of opposites of above and below, could not be reframed as an argument that human beings are even more wondrous than the angels. For the angels, at least in so far as they are not fallen, like Lucifer, Satan, and the hordes of demons in Milton's Paradise Lost, the angels that remain in the choir of eternity are as well beings of will and freedom, that they freely choose to sing the glory of God and thus reflect his will, love, and meaning into the world without ever departing from God's goodness. In Aquinas' Summa Theologica, the problem of the angel's aloofness or loftiness with respect to the temporal world and the counter-region to the heavenly spheres, which is hell, is solved by way of a speculation that the angels in fact observe the torments of those in hell as well as all sinful actions by humans in the natural world, spectacles which cause them both to weep and to exalt the profundity of justice. In a way, the angels remain unencumbered by sin or the will to do evil. And so one could make the claim that insofar as human beings are the marriage bond of terrestrial and celestial potencies, they exceed the angels in wonder for this reason alone. That is, through their ability to receive redemption from sin and to will the good, thereby transfiguring the lower elements of human nature and the temporal order into a new accord with the spiritual and the divine. Pico's own reason for believing that human beings are the most wondrous goes back to Genesis, the creation of human beings in God's image, a situation in Genesis 1 that he reinvents, somewhat in terms of Plato's idea of a cosmic demiurge. Now the highest father, God, the master builder, had, by the laws of his secret wisdom, fabricated this house, this world which we see, a very superb temple of divinity. He had adorned the super-celestial region with minds, that is, the primary emanations or aspects of God's intelligence. He had animated the celestial globes with eternal souls, that is, the angels, and he had filled with a diverse throng of animals the cast-off and residual parts of the lower worlds. But with the work unfinished, the artisan desired that there would be someone to reckon up the reason of such a big work, to love its beauty and to wonder at its greatness. Accordingly, now that all things had been completed, as Moses and Timaeus testify, note there the accord of Moses with Plato, he lastly considered creating man, but there was nothing in the archetypes from which he could mold a new sprout, nor anything in his storehouses which he could bestow as a heritage upon a new son, nor was there an empty judiciary seat where this contemplator of the universe could sit. Everything was filled up, all things had been laid out in the highest, the lowest, and the middle orders. Therefore he took up man, a work of indeterminate form, and placed him at the midpoint of the world, speaking to him as follows. Pico almost seems to imagine here a new Bible, to which these words of God to Adam might be added. We have given to thee, Adam, no fixed seat, 
no form of thy very own, no gift peculiarly thine. A limited nature in other creatures is confined within the laws written down by us. In conformity with thy free judgment, in whose hands I have placed thee, thou art confined by no bounds, and thou wilt fix the limits of nature for thyself. I have placed thee at the center of the world, neither heavenly nor earthly, neither mortal nor immortal have we made thee. Thou art the molder and maker of thyself. Thou mayest sculpt thyself into whatever shape thou dost prefer. Thou can grow downwards into the lower natures which are brutes, and thou canst again grow upwards from thy soul's reason into the higher natures which are divine. In making humanity, or the Adam Kadmon, in his own image, God gives human beings two gifts, free will and creative reason. The scene is almost comical with God looking into his bag of essences after having created the world, all its regions and beings, and finding that there are no essences left. But he now creates, according to his divine plan, is a creature whose existence precedes its essence, and whose essence is as yet indeterminate between unbounded celestial and bounded terrestrial existence. This is not an existentialist skepticism or disavowal of the very concept of essence or prioritizing of existence over essence in general, but it is a fullness of essence realized or not realized in the wondrous living existence that is the human being. Human beings are the most wondrous because their lives in the center or middle are microcosms of creation and of created beings as a whole. And because our free will, combined with our knowledge or intelligence, qualifies us as beings of wonder. The strangest crowning experiment of creation, but an experiment that can also go disastrously wrong. Disaster here having the literal meaning of an unstarring. So to review, humans were the last to receive an essence from the Creator. There were no more essences left, so God made our essence that of creating our own essence and placed us in the middle of everything. Man thus becomes, in Pico's Renaissance Manifesto, an animal of diverse, multiform, destructible nature. In other words, the human being is a chameleon. This definition is to be preferred to Aristotle's definition of man as the rational animal, because it is not reason alone that defines us, but additionally our material nature as enacting the marriage bond of above and below from the position of a mobile center. Pico's Christian Neoplatonism here closely resembles the Islamic Neoplatonism of Al-Farabi we studied last week. In the arc Neoplatonist Plotinus, the goal of any being is to return to the first cause, to lose all relative being in reunion with absolute unity. Pico combines Plotinian metaphysics with Christian soteriology or theory of salvation, wherein man, by perfecting his rational capacities and will, becomes godlike in grace. And Pico also returns from Neoplatonism to Aristotle and Plato. Plato had maintained that the one or the good is superior to and beyond being. Aristotle held that being and the one were the same. For Pico, this is not really a disagreement. Taking on board the Neoplatonic interpretation of Aristotle, he argues, being, or the realm of the forms, is the secondary level of reality derived from the one, that is, the mind, or intellect, or secondary paternal intellect, the new. Soul, or the psyche, is the third level derived from the second, and is thus the mind present in particular entities, whether they are embodied in the subtle spiritual matter of angels, or the lower spiritual matter of the physical world. It is important to underline for the student new to studying the Renaissance that natural philosophy, natural law, natural science, and magical practices were very often one and the same for the Renaissance philosophers. Science as we know it, rooted in empirical observation and experiment, separated itself only very gradually from esotericism, alchemy, and angelology. To the Renaissance mind, nature and human life was indeed a realm of magical forces and signs. The Neoplatonic concept of theurgy, which Neoplatonic thinkers derived from Orphic practices as well as from the Chaldean oracles, were seen by Pico as fully consistent with Christian theology and dogma, so long as the form of magic that was practiced was sufficiently philosophical and not motivated by maleficent intent. Another key point to consider very carefully in Pico 
is how his concept of reason, rationality, or the Logos is not only fully compatible with, but is in fact an expression of divine inspiration or the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian system of Christian theology. But just as Plato had distinguished from a divinely granted and a pathological form of mania, Pico promotes an idea of holy ambition as well as Socratic frenzy from Rami's book on the hermetic aspects of the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. On Pico, he writes, the Renaissance scholar Hans Blumenberg contends that Pico's sentiment, emergent in Cusa and taken to heretical extremes in Bruno, is in some ways more traumatic for Christian civilization and more defining for modernity than the rise of empirical science. A concept of freedom emerges in Pico that is not yet the Prometheanism it would become for later moderns, but an injunction to humanity to cooperate with the divine. Contrary to what one might expect, this is not exactly a humanism. For Pico's homo magus is both more and less than humanist. The human essence is constituted not by fixed proportions or through clear analogies, but by an open series of sympathies and affinities that must be continuously reconstructed through a creative elaboration of signs and similitudes. Having just concurred with Rami that Pico's emphasis on divine human perfectibility is not Promethean in a later romantic sense, it is interesting that Pico explains his doctrine of transmigration in the oration in terms of Asclepius' symbolization of the human being by Prometheus in secret rites. Reinventing many theological controversies and heresies from the first few centuries of the Common Era, fully human and fully divine, Christ is, for Pico, still the only one. And yet the task of the imitatio Christi, or imitation of Christ for human beings, is more achievable than we might think. Let us fly beyond the chambers of the world to the chamber nearest to the most lofty divinity. There, as the sacred mysteries reveal, the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones occupy the first places. Ignorant of how to yield to them and unable to endure the second places, let us compete with the angels in dignity and glory. Christ, a full human, full divinity, exists with God in the loftiest chamber. And why should the human being, after all the most wondrous being, imagine its celestial destiny in any less dignified and glorious terms? In Pico's angelology, the seraph angels burn with the fire of charity, the cherubs shine with the radiance of intelligence, and the throne angels stand in the steadfastness of judgment. Holy ambition indeed, to wish on the basis of the spiritual ordeal that is this world, that the human soul could exceed the gods in charity, intelligence, and judgment. But Pico is indeed suggesting that we attempt precisely that, so as to cleave more closely to the Christian Savior. Pico goes on in some of the more worryingly heretical passages in his oration. He who is a seraph, that is, a lover, is in God, and more, God is in him, and God and he are one. It is Pico's third Neoplatinian step God and the soul being one, which causes all the problems for his 900 Theses. Pico wrote the oration as a defense of his 900 Theses. And this is why at this stage in the speech, he quotes St. Paul, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, the story of Jacob's Ladder, and even Egyptian mythology to try to make his potentially heretical doctrine more palatable. Keep in mind, this is still the late 1400s. And yet Pico, probably reading from Plutarch's treatise on Isis and Osiris, gives an account of Osiris that is consummately modern. Descending and ascending along the great chain of being, through transmutation, the human soul, with no fixed essence, undergoes a ritual death or rending by titanic force into many distinct parts, as well as an ascending and a gathering into the one from the many. Osiris and Dionysus are often compared, beginning with Plutarch in the second century CE fusing seamlessly Egyptian and Greek mythology in one phrase. Pico compares the ritual dismemberment of Osiris as a vegetative fertility god to the reconstruction of the perfectible human soul by an Apollonian force. I would argue that this passage in Pico is a major influence on Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. Pico's statement here is more or less an introduction of the Dionysian-Apollonian duality into philosophy in the Renaissance here understood as a privileged mythological metaphor for the process by which human beings integrate lower and higher dimensions of the great chain of being into their soul, finally coming to rest in the bosom of the Father who is at the top of the ladder and therein becoming consumed by a theological happiness. 
saying that pagan myths, such as those of Osiris, Dionysus, or Apollo, have something to teach us about Christian initiation into religious revelation is certainly too much and altogether pagan for Pico's audience at the time, so he quickly pivots to his interpretation of the Book of Job, although not without using the pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles to try to understand Job. Empedocles had taught that there are two natures implanted within us, strife and love, two cosmic principles, the one tending downwards and the other upwards. Strife and friendship, war and peace, drive human life one way and then another. Only deep calm and a natural and moral philosophy will produce a most holy treaty between the flesh and the spirit. The Book of Job itself, for Pico, teaches this Empedoclean wisdom in the form of a moral fable. Pico adores and has obviously read very carefully the history of Christian philosophy. He weds his own soul to it and also wishes that Mother Theology will wed its soul to the insights of all other divine world historical religions. This is a bracingly open and cosmopolitan religious project, seeking not only comparative grounds of agreement, but genuine dialogue and mutual learning and enhancement. The study of philosophy is to be recommended, not as something that would or could deflect us from a marriage with mother theology, but rather as the intellectual art that prepares us for death and for the fullness of life that death reveals, and in which all limited conceptions, endemic to our mortal intellectual life, are re-evaluated from the point of view of God's true cosmic intelligence and historical plan for all creation. As the oration winds to a conclusion, Pico seeks additional support for his claims in Moses, for whom even the angels, in the fullness of their holy and inexpressible intelligence, are drunk on their own nectar, within their ineffable closeness to God. Pico here imagines an equally inspired priesthood of philosophers, who would uphold rather than denigrate the merits of sublime theology. Notice that Pico does not reduce religion to philosophy, but suggests that philosophy is a privileged divine activity of the soul that leads to a truer knowledge of religion and prepares us for authentic religious experiences. As we shift gears into the modern history of philosophy and modern philosophical religion, we'll notice that this is one of the last times for a while in which claims like this are made. Pico's reading of ancient Greek religion and mystery religion specifically the gods Apollo and Dionysus, become even more developed at this point. I would go so far as to say that Pico's oration is one of the unsung influencers on German Romanticism and idealism, especially in Friedrich Hödelin, Friedrich Schelling, and later the early Nietzsche, as we'll see later in the course. The Greek mystery religions underlying Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy are far from the only sources that Pico draws from, however. He again underlines the influence in his thinking of Pythagoras, the Chaldean oracles, the Persian prophet Zoroaster, David, Augustine, the Kabbalists, and Arabic scholars. And Pico has harsh words to say for those who are against the close study of the history of philosophy. Summing up all the philosophers to which Pico is particularly indebted and to whom he devotes important theses in his 900 Theses, Pico gives a praises underlying the virtues of soul that the study of each of them promotes. So Pico thinks all these philosophers and many more are amazing, and he's right. Pico also wants to add to our philosophy curriculum, the Corpus Hermeticum, and more from the ancient mystery schools. And he wishes to prove that Plato and Aristotle were not so very different as we have been led to assume. And he quotes this learned opinion from many important historical authorities. Having given his bibliography and his philosophical resume of sorts, Pico closes his oration with a few major orienting points for his 900 Theses. And this is where Pico finally broaches the vexed topic of natural and good magic. If this video has been a bit complicated, I apologize. But please understand that Pico's oration is indeed an adequate and inspired study of 900 philosophical points he makes in more detail. Very naively and youthfully hopeful that the community of learned Christian theologians will engage diligently and open-mindedly with his work. The outcome of this epic philosophical battle royale was not as Pico would have hoped. In a popular introduction to the history of Western esoterica, Patrick Harbour sums up Pico's contribution when he quotes Francis A. Yates, The profound significance of Pico de la Mirandola in the history of humanity can hardly be overestimated. He is the first thinker to boldly formulate a new position for European man, man as magus using both Magia and Kabbalah to act upon the world and to control his destiny by science. 
For more on Renaissance philosophy in general, I would recommend The Individual and the Cosmos in Renaissance Philosophy by Ernest Kasserer. And for more on Pico's argument in favor of natural magic, I would recommend the chapter on Pico in Francis Yates' Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. Lastly, if you get really interested in Renaissance philosophy and want to go even deeper, uh, the next stage after reading Pico carefully would be to check out Giordano Bruno, books such as On the Infinite, The Universe and the Worlds, The Expulsion of the Triumphant Beast, The Shadow of Ideas, The Art of Memory, as well as The Kabbalah of Pegasus. Renaissance philosophy as a whole is still an inexhaustible source for our contemporary and postmodern philosophical consciousness. I think our biggest takeaway for the rest of the course in studying Pico uh, was well articulated by Rami in The Hermetic Deleuze when he points out that despite having all the hallmarks of a modern humanism, Pico's metaphysics of the human soul is more correctly read as transhumanistic. In the third point here, the ideal of the human operator who is able through moral purity and mental acumen to ascend through the levels of natural, mathematical, and finally divine orders before reaching parity with the divine mind and becoming a co-creator with God. Okay, thanks everyone for listening and I hope you enjoyed the Pico. Up next, Descartes and the Origins of Modern Philosophy. This is that peace which God creates in his heavens, which the angels descending to earth proclaim to men of good will. That through it, men might ascend to heaven and become angels. Contemplation of nature, looking to nature not with only with scientific eyes, but through nature, getting the idea behind nature. Whatever seeds each man cultivates will grow to maturity and bear in him their own fruit. If they be vegetative, it will be like a plant. I have read in the records of the Arabians, Reverend Fathers, that Abdallah the Saracen, when questioned as to what on this stage of the world, as it were, could be seen to be most worthy of wonder, replied, there is nothing to be seen more wonderful than man. In agreement with this opinion is the saying of Hermes Trismegistus, a great miracle, Asclepius, is man. At last it seems to me I have come to understand why man is the most fortunate of creatures and consequently worthy of all admiration and what precisely is that rank which is his lot in the universal chain of being, a rank to be envied not only by brutes but even by the stars and by minds beyond this world. The best of artisans, the creative powers, addressed man thus. The nature of all other beings is limited and constrained within the bounds of laws prescribed by us. Thou, constrained by no limits, in accordance with thine own free will, in whose hand we have placed thee, thou shalt ordain for thyself the limits of thy nature. Thou shalt have the power to degenerate into the lower forms of life, which are brutish. Thou shalt have the power, out of thy soul's judgment, to be reborn into the higher forms, which are divine. Whatever seeds each man cultivates will grow to maturity and bear in him their own fruit. If they be vegetative, he will be like a plant. If of the senses, he will become brutish. If intellectual, he will become an angel and the son of God. If rational, he will grow into a heavenly being. And if, happy in the lot of no created thing, he withdraws into the center of his own unity, his spirit, made one with God, in the solitary darkness of God, who is set above all things, he shall surpass them all. So let a certain holy ambition invade our souls, so that, not content with the mediocre, we shall pant after the highest. And since we may, if we wish, toil with all our strength to obtain it, full of divine power, we shall no longer be ourselves, but shall become he himself who made us. For he who knows himself in himself knows all things, as Zoroaster first wrote. 
I have also proposed theorems dealing with magic, in which I've indicated that magic has two forms, one of which depends entirely on the work and authority of demons, a thing to be abhorred, so help me the god of truth, and a monstrous thing. The other, when it is rightly pursued, is nothing else than the utter perfection of natural philosophy. The former can claim for itself the name of neither art nor science, while the latter, abounding in the loftiest mysteries, embraces the deepest contemplation of the most secret things, and at last, the knowledge of all nature. As the farmer weds his vines to elms, so does the magus wed earth to heaven. That is, he weds the lower things to the endowments and powers of higher things. If all of this appears new and strange to you, Reverend Fathers, think on how the sphinxes carved into the temples of the Egyptians reminded them that the mystic doctrine should be kept inviolable from the common herd by means of the knots of riddles. The theologian, Oregon, asserts that Jesus Christ, the teacher of life, made many revelations to his disciples which they were unwilling to write down lest they become commonplaces to the rabble. This is in the highest degree confirmed by Dionysius the Areopagite, who says that the occult mysteries were conveyed by the founders of religion from mind to mind without writing through the medium of speech. Let us consult the Apostle Paul, the chosen vessel, when he himself was exalted to the third heaven. He will answer, according to the secret interpretations of Dionysius, that he saw the cherubim being purified then being illuminated, and at last being made perfect. When we have been so soothingly called, so kindly urged, we shall with winged feet fly up like earthly mercuries to the embraces of our Blessed Mother and enjoy that wished-for peace, most holy peace, indivisible bond in one accord with the friendship through which all rational souls not only shall come into harmony with the one mind which is above all minds, but shall, in some ineffable way, become all together one. This is that peace which God creates in his heavens, which angels descending to earth proclaim to men of good will that through it men might ascend to heaven and become angels. Let us wish this peace for our friends, for our century.